welcome. Uh, we got a, an audience here. It's 302, so we'll get started and be respectful of your time and everyone else's time. And so uh, welcome to the, the happy hour for ISMSI for this month. Uh, we are very humbled and honored to have uh, Dr. Lori Moore, Lori Moore Merrill, I apologize, uh, U.S. Fire Administrator. Uh, if you don't know who that is, you've apparently been living under a rock for the last few years because uh, she is doing more for the American Fire Service than we've seen in a long time. And we are very lucky to have her today to uh, discuss some of the things going on in the American Fire Service. So um, I think maybe we'll start with just kind of the strategic plan, the vision of, of the U.S. Fire Administration um, and some of the, the concepts of the one voice and that sort of thing. Just for everybody, just to get a background, and then you know we'll go into some other topics and open some questions and answers and that sort of stuff. So, Dr. Moore, I turn it over to you. That sounds great, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, um, I remember doing this happy hour like way before COVID, and that's sort of a time marker now, isn't it? So uh, it's great to be back with this group again. I know uh, some are the same, a lot may be changed, and so new folks in the room. So I'm always honored to spend time uh, with ISFSI. And so, um, as Brian said, I'm talking a little bit about uh, where we are in the national strategy. I'm happy to, Brian, I've got, uh, if you want pictures, I know a lot of people like pictures when I'm talking, sure. uh, I can share them. I don't think okay. I have the permission to do that, but. Let, let me see how I do that for you. See. Okay. Maybe you can make something happen here for you. There we go, you did it. Awesome. There we go. All right. Let me um, select a window. Perfect. All right. You guys are going to tell me if you're seeing uh, slides on the screen. Okay, perfect. So uh, let me now get the to the top of them. That might be helpful. You guys can see it's been a day around here already, so please forgive me. All right, here we go. Perfect. All right. So I will start by telling you that it is our uh, 50th anniversary. Is that better, Brian? Can you see the slides? And then I know there's a trail down the side, but. Yep, we are good to go. You're tracking? Okay, good. So um, 1974, uh, folks, and since the National um, the Fire Prevention and Safety Act was passed, and that was passed off the back of uh, America Burning Report that I'm sure all of you are well familiar, familiar with. And so this is our 50th anniversary. Now, uh, obviously, we're already carrying a new logo uh, for this year, and we will have some celebration. Um, the CSFI has initiated a video, and so there's going to be a bit of celebration at the CSFI event uh, in April. And then uh, we will do some things on campus during the summer. And then the big celebration for the fire service will take place at our summit in October uh, during fire prevention week. So I thought that's important that you all know about that. And mentioning the summit, of course, um, the summit is um, our annual event. So the summit was supposed to have been held as part of our legislation tells us to do an annual conference on fire prevention and control based on the, the legislation. Um, and what was contained, what's our mission. And so that had never happened uh, to anyone's knowledge and uh, historians um, concur until 2022. So we held the first one, uh, it was by invitation only, we kept it small, but broadcast. And then in 23, we opened it up, we filled our E auditorium, which is about 500 people. And at, uh, at max time period, when the president was speaking, we were at 7,000 people online. So it was quite large as far as a turnout. We maintained around 4,000 throughout the day. And so we're hoping to continue to expand those numbers as the summit becomes a very dynamic event uh, for us at USFA and certainly for the fire service at large. It's a place where really the one voice effort came to be. It's where we brought all the national organizations together and said, you know, I don't want you to set aside your mission, but can we come along together and stand with one voice on the biggest challenges that we have across our industry? And so uh, we are doing that. So what has evolved as part of that one voice effort is what we refer to as the National Fire Service Strategy. And so with that, uh, it started out in 22 with six challenges that were prominent 
in 23, we added an additional four. And so those are the 10 in the rings that you see on the left of the screen. And so the uh, initial one, well, I'm getting some, uh, maybe someone's got their mic open. There yes, we go. Everybody can just mute, it'd be great. All right, thank you. Um, so each of these, we have um, individuals that are asked to remain on the day after the summit where we can talk together, establish priorities in each of these challenges, and then establish a work group that carries on throughout the year between summits. They have a mid-year report out at the CSFI event so that they bring forward and do their mid-year report out from each group. Where are you? What are we looking at? What actions have been completed? Uh, uh, any additional recommendations? What's the dynamics that are changing in this particular space? And so it really does open up the opportunity for anyone who wants to be involved in a particular work group. You have the opportunity to do that. We have leaders from across the scope of the national organizations, each with their, you know, have a particular interest that they they want to lead, then they do so. And so it really is um, bringing the fire service together with this one voice to, to look at our challenges. And so climate change being a big one, we started out with looking at wildfire, but as you'll note here, looking at everything from the gaps in training, interoperability and our communications, what do we need to face climate change? Not just in wildfire, but in these severe storms, in the flooding, in the droughts, in the extreme heat. You know, what are we what are we looking at? And so, again, in the wildfire venue, which seems to be you know always more prominent for us, is um, the wildfire commission report. And so we've been very much a part of that. We pulled out all of the the 148 recommendations that are in this report. USFA is mentioned in a good number of them. FEMA is mentioned in a good number of them. And so we've highlighted those and are really leaning into uh, one of them in particular. If you looked at the commission report, of course it's available online, but recommendation 56 specifically says that USFA has got to have more funding. We can't accomplish our mission uh, without um, additional resources. And so that report I think is going to help us one of the other things that's new to FEMA is really responding to major disasters related to wildfire. And so uh, they've done it in the past, but they really are experts at hurricanes uh, and wind water events. So we're still, um, they're coming along beautifully, but they're still learning a lot about wildfire and the dynamic nature of wildfire and how do we better prepare, respond and recover when you've got one of these events that really is a suburban conflagration not a wildland fire. And so we really talk a lot about, we don't use the word wildland here unless we are talking about the interface because we do not represent the wildland. That's forestry, that's Department of Interior, it's BLM. We represent our stakeholders in the structural environment arena, in our communities. And so when these things are commingled, of course, we talk and we work together, but we have such little focus on these community conflagrations like Lahaina, like the Marshall Fire in Colorado, like the, the Paradise and the Camp Fire that really uh, engulfed those communities that were interface. That was an interface fire, right? So understanding the difference matters and being able to talk about the difference matters. And so this is something we really leaned into on that commission report because Congress does not understand it. In fact, those who are talking about it at any level don't understand. They just say, well done, fire. Well, these are not wildland fires. And so it's imperative that as you all are teaching that you know and, and talk about the difference and not just use words um, you know, frivolously as we, uh, we talk about these things. One of the other things that we've been able to do is really expand our reach into science and technology uh, over at DHS. They fund a lot of projects. It's just that USFA had never really had or taken the advantage to have any input into what they fund. So we really have leaned in and with a lot of, um, um, I'll call it enthusiasm, uh, <clears throat> to say, oh no, you're gonna find what we need in our first responder arena, we need this. And so these wildfire sensors are part of that. We're deploying wildfire sensors across Hawaii islands uh, because that Lahaina fire is not the last one they're gonna have. And so in order to know ignition early, in order to use technology that's being developed, we need to put it in the field. And so we're working with our fire departments uh, across the islands to make sure that they're covered. We're also gonna be working in several other departments. You see the list there. 
where we're going to put these sensors. And so when I call on departments to say, listen, we need to test technology, we want to put it in the field, that's USFA's role. It's just never been done before. And so it is uh, something that we are leaning into, and there's more tech to come uh, from S&T. You're going to hear more about a wildfire evacuation toolkit. You're going to hear more about uh, a wildfire index uh, for the built environment. Um, so there's a lot more science and tech that we've never um, really captured or gotten our hands into before that is, uh, is going to be discussed. Another part of the One Voice group is that we come together and it's uh, typically the heads of the national organizations or, uh, or their designee and we come together to, to address fire in general. Now this happens to be the wildfire. These shots are from the wildfire stop tour, but we've done two fire stop tours for structural fire, um, starting in New York to Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., where C-SPAN carried it all live. Uh, we've also done Detroit uh, down through, um, uh, where did we go after Detroit? Somebody probably knows, um, to Columbus. I know we ended in Columbus, but we did structural fire. We talked about the fact, Chicago, how can I forget that? Chicago um, to um, Columbus where we talk about people still dying in, in fives and fours. And we had had three uh, five person multiples by the time we were doing the, the fire shop tour um, earlier this year. And we have to address this. We've got to stand up and say, you know, this is, this is burning. We may have stabilized the number of fires, but the ones we're having are much more deadly. Somebody has got to pay attention. And so that's the intent of these fire stop tours, where we do station visits, we do community engagement, we invite people to come and talk to us um, and to talk about the fire problem in the media. And so that really is around the, the fire and the wildfire space and climate change. And then we're addressing recruitment and retention. Um, this is something that you're going to hear more and more about because it's not just USFA, but I've asked the national orgs, uh, IFF, the IFC, the NVFC, those with members who are front lines to deal with this and you come up, what's the national campaign? How can we do this like the military does it? We've got to overcome this recruitment issue. Uh, we are already low in ranks across the nation and that's only going to continue to exacerbate as we see people retire and we're not bringing them in. Now there's a few anomalies to that where people are uh, not having recruitment issues and I hear every once in a while from a chief going, you know, our numbers are back up. Uh, we're getting good um, candidates, but often we get them through the hiring process, but they can't get through recruit school. Um, these are the kinds of challenges that we have to continue to tackle because all of that's relevant to the recruitment and then the retention um, situation. And so we have a group that's working on that. We also have a group that's looking at the cancer um, situation. And this group, I believe, has actually split into cancer and PFAS, two different groups. And so they are um, a very large uh, work group. And also this group is working with the National Firefighter Registry. So we try to connect the dots across these subjects as well to make sure that if there are efforts that we're not having duplicative efforts going on in silos, that Let's let's put it all in one box and talk about it. So we just did that. Uh, you're going to see something come out of the White House. Uh, I had expected it this week. It could be next week, but on the president's moonshot, it's going to address firefighter cancer this month. And so we uh, submitted some uh, talking points and some things to go into the release. So this is getting attention. We have talked with the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. We have met with um, anybody who has anything to do with PFAS. And so it really is, um, you know, roll up your sleeves and, you know, figure this out kind of engagement with all of the other federal agencies. And so this uh, is, is a big one for us. Mental health. Is another of the strategies. Obviously, we're still working on resilience. I'm really excited to hear what this group's going to come back with. Because we've asked this time for the groups to find action items, what can we actually do and report? We can't keep whining about things and making recommendations. We have to do the work. And so uh, what, what have you done? And so I'm looking forward to hearing from this group so that they can recount accomplishments that we, across the board, not USFA, not one of the national orgs, but if one of the national orgs does something, we all take credit for it. 
as the one voice of the fire service. And so that's kind of the concept. If, if we can all, you know, lift each other up and share our successes um, as well as our challenges, that's going to be key. And so this is a big one, I think. Um, elevating through codes and standards, we really need to continue that fight. We've got a lot of communities still being built, not to code. And what are we going to do? They're going to burn down. And so particularly in these fire prone lands, and we have to lean into this. We've got to continue to lean into uh, the fire threat in our stru structures that are not fire safe. Uh, we still see far too many deaths. And, and uh, I apologize for this being dated, but I'll tell you what the numbers are. We're over 725 deaths right now um, in the nation. And so we're not even a full quarter, um, or excuse me, a full four months in uh, to the year. So the numbers, uh, we were averaging around nine a day. We ended last year with an average about six and a half, almost seven. So we'll see. We're not starting off very well this year. But we continue to couple that data with additional data to tell us, you know, who's dying. It's not just the number, but who, where are they? Uh, poor people and uh, obviously a lot of people of color. Um, and so these are the the situations that we've got to address as a, the nation's fire service and really be able to tell that story. Um, another one is around just elevating the fire service within the eyes of government. I mean, we did a, an event this morning where the flags for our line of duty deaths for the memorial next month were handed off and we had two senators and a congressperson show up just to hand those flags and to talk about firefighters. And so every time we do something like that, with the NFFF, or uh, you know, two organizations work together. You all work with with another national org to do something. That's the one voice. That's that is leveraging the power of both organizations or three organizations, you know, to really make a difference for the nation's fire service. And and that's what this one voice is about. And and I, I hope that you all are even brainstorming even right now um, about what could be done. Who could you partner with? to do some work in some of these different um, areas. So these next four are the ones that we've really added uh, in 23 to um, the national strategy. And I think these are really important. So one is EMS. We have added EMS. We're bringing in to the One Voice effort and this work group has some of our single role EMS national orgs uh, that are not traditional uh, fire-based um, you know, organizations. So they came and said, can we be part of the One Voice? And of course, we want everybody to come along. Uh, if you want to help work the problem, then let's work the problem together. And so um, these is uh, this is some of the priorities that we're looking at within the EMS space. Um, recruitment here is a crossover, obviously, with the great recruitment group. So you'll start to see some similar uh, as far as priorities where these groups can work together and, uh, and carry on. Um, another one is our data and technology group. This is not the panels um, that are working on NEARS. This is a work group that is working to prepare the fire service for change. They are working on how do we change the culture of what we've all had to live with, with the INFER system, to now be open-minded to accept and embrace the new platform uh, that's going to be so easy um, in app based and give you real time information right back in the station uh, and at the department level. It's going to be so different um, that we really um, have to change culture, right? We've got to get people thinking about next. And so that's what this group is working on. How do we prepare the nation? the nation's fire service for next uh, when it comes to NERIS. So just a little bit of background. I know NERIS is something that Brian told me you wanted to, to talk about. So um, this is the authority within the legislation that I have um, to build a new system. So we operate the National Data Center. And I should tell you here, just as a bit of a sidebar, that on Monday, we onboarded Dr. Denise Smith. Uh, to now run the National Fire Data and Research Center. So Denise Smith, who you might know from Skidmore, and Denise, who's done all of the cardiac work and a lot of the, the firefighter health and safety, is now 
uh, at USFA. So she is now our head of the National Fire Research and Data Center. So we welcome Denise. You'll see some photos of me swearing her in and all of that. Uh, that'll come out at the end of the week. But uh, we're trying to build a solid team at USFA and really elevate uh, so that we can continue to really lead uh, the nation's fire service. And, and we want to do it in lockstep with our national organizations. So back to Nearest. Um, Nearest is going to be near real time. And I've really sort of already talked about some of these items um, around Nearest. It's an app-based platform, but you can use the computer. You can put in data from anything. And so we really wanted to make sure that it was um, really compatible uh, with you know, whether it's a department is so rural and so um, small that they've been using a paper logbook still to those that are, you know, our FDNYs and LA counties who literally can buy whatever they want uh, in most cases around their data systems. And these, so we, we want it to be scalable. And that's key because when we start onboarding departments this year, um, even more, we want them to come on at whatever level they can tolerate and they'll be able to get real value. They're going to have return uh, immediately. So whether it's somebody who has to use their, you know, their volunteer and they have to use their personal phone to enter the data, they're going to have access based on their department's uh, nearest ID number and uh, all of their security. Then we go to an intermediate, somebody who maybe is using a, a CAD connection or an RMS connection. Um, to get some additional insights and in some of their risk base. And then somebody who's quite advanced, who has a lot of capability from an API or data push and pull um, scenario. So we are going to meet the departments where they are and make sure that they have the capability to use and, uh, and leverage near us. So how's it going to work? Well, you'll have the data input uh, again, whatever scale and scope you are able from your department, it'll come into the platform and then you will immediately have um, established dashboards that's going to have your risk base in there from a geospatial um, uh, environment. You're going to have a lot of data that already resides in the system uh, nationwide. Then with the overlay of your incident information, we'll build some initial um, algorithms for analytics, but you'll also be able to have some capabilities. So nothing's going to be static. This has to be a dynamic system that will evolve um, as we evolve as the fire service and then the users um, everybody will have access i mean you'll have uh, obviously it'll be granted access it will be uh, through multi-factor identif uh, identification and login um, authentication is what i should have said and then uh, researchers you know all of these things will be verifiable on the uh, on the data platform and be able to be used so um, here's kind of the time frame around NEARS and what's coming. We just onboarded the initial six departments as the pilot um, test. And so those six departments are literally loading data from the very first day they onboarded. So we are working through that. In the end of June, going through July, we're going to onboard an additional 50 departments. We're working through the WHO. Based on the initial six, what we learned from them, uh, where's the low-hanging fruit for the next 50? And we'll onboard the next 50. We'll learn from them. We'll scale, tweak uh, the platform. And then in November of this year, we will open it, uh, open it up for nationwide onboarding. It will be a self-service onboarding. We'll give you instruction. You're going to have people to sort of do the hand-holding as we need to. But departments will spend, uh, we're still working through what kind of time you're going to spend to establish your profile because... The way this is intended to work, and we're building the system for this, is that, um, you know, for example, if you build your profile, we've got your risk-based information that in the future, once we can establish the API connection with FEMA Go, for example, if you're doing an AFG or SAFER grant, you won't have 80 pages of an application. You'll go in, put in your nearest ID number, and it will auto-populate most of your application. You just need to tell us then, what's this application? What are you asking for? Um, and then submit, right? So that's the intent. We'll have the capability. It'll be on now FEMA Go to be able to receive data from nearest. And so we'll work through that. But this is, uh, this is the intent here around, so, you know, the onboarding and the profile of the department. So that's going to be important that when we give the direction for onboarding that everybody completes as much as possible, because this may be, hopefully, uh, you'll do updates, but you won't ever have to complete it all again, right? So 
um, that is something that we're looking forward to. So if you haven't watched one of the nearest webinars, we've got full webinars. There's more to come. We try to do one every quarter. We're going to do, we've got a newsletter that's coming out. Uh, we've got um, executive level um, things that we distribute all the time to the chiefs and, and such. So they're ready. They've got data people who are ready to do onboarding. So we're trying to do as much culture change as possible. So that's a little more on nearest. Uh, but if you haven't watched some of those, please go and watch some of the webinars because they will help you understand uh, the total transparency here of what's being built and how uh, we anticipate onboarding departments. We also added lithium ion. And so this is something I know you all have embraced. Uh, I think I saw Dan Medrakowski come on. So this is something I know you all uh, is really leaning into. Lithium ion has to be part of our discussion what's next beyond lithium ion. We're already talking about hydrogen cell. We're talking about sodium ion in a lot of places, not just in our nation, but globally. So there's going to be next. Can we find something safer than lithium ion? You know, what's the challenges? And so we have a work group who's, who's looking at that, um, really the scope and scale of lithium ion fire challenges across the nation and the ongoing research, because right now it's not just research in a lab, it's every event, every incident, is a research opportunity and so having nearest to capture data that we've not captured before uh, is going to enable us even more here to learn and understand uh, what is the fire problem in the nation and so it won't just be new york city anymore who has the data hopefully all of us nationwide uh, will be able to access our own information and understand the scale of this problem on our own communities so um, the last one that I will talk about is, and this of course is Denise Smith's uh, baby, but it is the cardiac. We had cancer and behavior health, and this was raised during the after meeting at the summit that, you know, cardiac's still an issue. We've got to talk about cardiac um, health and well-being of our firefighters. And so that has been added as the 10th um, strategy in our national strategy. So um, Brian, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, turn it back over mm -hmm. to you. Okay. And uh, see if we've got some some questions. I hope that sure. was was helpful for you. No, it was great. I think it was a, an awesome overview. It's a couple of things I the, you know I garner out of that that is kind of interesting. Is I'm from Missouri. You know, we get some small leaf fires and those sort of things, and a few hundred acres here and there. And and, in, and two years ago, you know. We actually in Missouri had a wildland urban interface fire um, that destroyed the town of Woldridge. And so been in the Missouri fire service 24 years and never, ever heard of anything like that happening. And so mm. the, it's changing, right? I mean, to people that want to don't maybe admit it or whatever, but it's changing. And, you know, 5,000 acres and 23 homes burn, it, it puts it on the radar. And we're getting yes. more of those, those wildland urban interface fires um, and even just, you know, the, the, the the large fire little conflagrations is, is big and then of course the nearest coming in and actually having real-time data instead of this inverse data that we have that's you know hard to hard to analyze hard to get and then it's just going to be exciting so I'm excited for it. all right one question i was going to ask you uh dr Lord, is we're, we've received a lot of information this year about AFG grant funding and what that would look like and trying to hit our legislators up with letters and, and requesting and ISMSI is taking a position on that of obviously we want to maintain AFG grant funding. Um, from your perspective from D.C., have you heard anything on that or elaborate on that at all? Sure, I'm happy to. So um, I heard this morning, we I mentioned the flag ceremony. Um, I think it was two guys. I've done this a couple of times today, so forgive me. Um, but a flag ceremony this morning, I encountered um, uh, a couple of folks from the House and the Senate. Of course, the Senate's already passed our reauthorization of both the USFA and Safer and AFG. The House, I am learned, uh, is supposed to pass it this afternoon or tomorrow. Hopefully, I'm knocking on wood that that happens. If they do, it'll go back to the Senate uh, for any changes that happen. And they've uh, assured, obviously, that they would get it done. So I'm hopeful that the reauthorizations are going to happen because as of September, uh, USFA, AFG, SAFER, there is no authorization that they continue. And so, I mean, we've been around 50 years, so I'm hopeful that, you know, that would uh, certainly do it with or without authorization, but the grants will not. So uh, we're hoping the House actually gets something done today because this is bipartisan and, uh, you know, something that they can 
they can accomplish um, and then say, you know, that was good. Perfect. I know it's been a, 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 in a lot of our minds um, with, you know, us receiving grant funding and safer grants and everything like that. Obviously, the, author, the reauthorization of that would be huge for all of us and uh, affects us all in the fire service. Yes. Um, another question I was going to ask you, uh, and then we'll kind of open it up to everybody else on the call is, uh, and it kind of affects everyone in the fire services, these apparatus lead times and costs. Mm. And, you know, we're all facing the, the inflation and, and, and everything related to post-COVID. And so uh, the fire service and the fire trucks and apparatus is no different. But we're seeing lead times of four and five years, even six years for some trucks. Costs are double what they were four and five years ago. And that's affecting the fire service uh, across the nation. And so even your large departments, your FTNYs, your Bostons, and those places are being hit by this cost. Is the U.S. Fire Administrator, what thoughts on that or, or takeaways or how can we better prepare or what do you see the future holding? Yeah. So, and that's, I wish I had better news for you, but um, I can tell you that we addressed this almost immediately when I came in uh, in 2021 and I talked to the secretary about it, secretary of Homeland uh, constantly. The IFC has met with him uh, directly. So we, we have continual conversation about this. So first of all, what he committed to doing, which he did was, make sure it is not a border issue that we can't get the parts into the the country that are necessary for producing uh or manufacturing our vehicles and uh, that has been confirmed it is not a border issue it is uh, more about the production of the vehicles and the prioritization of the vehicles which we don't have uh, authority uh, to do so Chevy, Ford, all of those who produce the engines and some of those things. So from what we understood and what we could find out through uh, our DHS connections is that part of the breakdown is that they won't prioritize. They're producing those post-COVID vehicles and vehicles are selling, as you all know, even personal vehicles and people buying them. And that's where, you know, the money is coming, obviously. And so that's the priority. We just can't get them to prioritize, prioritize emergency vehicles. And so this is part of our ongoing uh, conversations. And so it is, I can tell you, it's front of mind for the IFF and the IFC as well. And every fire chief I talk to, um, this is an issue. I was just with um, the Hawaii, Brad Ventura, who's the chief of Maui County. And Brad's four years. He had apparatus burned up. So it's not like they got something else, right? And so they're telling him five, year, five years to get engine replacements. So he's running the engines that are, you know, they may or may not make it to the call kind of situation. And so these are, it's down to, all right, can I call another fire chief who's on the list, who's going to get some earlier than four years? And can you trade places with Brad, um, you know, because you have some options for reserves. He has none. It's that kind of, uh, unfortunately, you know, trade-offs between conversations between chiefs right now. So we are working it. We are aware of it. Um, the secretary is concerned about it. It's just that we don't have a lot of authority in our space. If it's not one of our spaces, that's the problem. Does that make sense, Brian? And, and please do a follow-up question if it does not. No, it, it does. And I think it's just the supply and demand. And, you know, we think of ourselves sometimes in the, in the public sector, in the public safety sector, that, you know, we should be influenced by uh, the business sector and the private sector. And, uh, you know, anybody sells equipment or fire apparatus is, is in a private sector. <laughs> and so, yes. um, you know, it's hard for us to sometimes rationalize that in our head that, you know, and it's the truth, right? It's just the world's it's the economy that we live in. And, and so I, I can fully understand uh, the perspectives of it and that sort of thing. It's just, uh, it makes it very difficult for us uh, in administration, as you mentioned, um, and, you know, hard to go out to Hawaii and Maui County. I can't imagine having trucks destroyed and then being told five years to get trucks replaced and, you know, and then you're trying to barter positions. Um, it's just a crazy thought in uh, in my head, but uh, to your point, it's, the, it's where we're at, I guess, as a, as a world. So kind of crazy. Um, is there, if anybody has any questions, we, yeah, we'll put them in the chat here. Um, they were asking, uh, Alan asked if there was a date for the U.S. Uh, for the summit in October. Yeah, it's October 8th. I think that's a Tuesday. October 8th. Yeah, okay. it's Fire Prevention Week, October. I'm almost certain it's October 8th. Um, it will be at NETC just like last year, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, we'll do the mid-year report outs in April at the CSFI, so all the groups, uh, group leaders at the least will be reporting out on all that national strategy, and then they'll deliver their final reports 
uh, at the summit, and then we'll do the roundtable again with our national leaders and um, and have the continued conversation. So if you can join us, please do so in person. We'll open up registration. I believe we open it in July ish or early August at the latest uh, for registration on campus in person, but then it'll be live broadcast as well. And it's a, yeah, it, it, a fantastic event last year. They, you know, as, as Dr. Moore said, is, you know, there was 7,000 people listening online. I can't think of any, you know, events where there's that much data coming out at us uh, throughout the course of a day that's really impacting the American Fire Service throughout that entire eight hour period. Um, and to be able to watch that, to see the speakers and and just to have the constant 4,000, as you mentioned, I believe, throughout the day is, is just an impressive. And I, I think it just is a, is a testament to where we're at as a fire service. We're all wanting to see what's next and be a part of that, which is a uh, which is an awesome uh, which is an awesome concept and idea. So uh, if anyone else has any questions, you can uh, unmute your mic or just tap me in the chat and I can I can ask as well. Um, one question I was going to ask just of you as well is anything new with the NFA? Um, or anything that you want to discuss going on at the NFA that maybe we want to know about from us as the instructors in the training arm? Yeah. Um, so there's always something new at the NFA. Um, so we, um, the superintendent there, you all know, has a lot of energy. And so we just did the EFO uh, symposium last week. It was packed. Um, I think there were nearly 300 people there. And so I'm understanding that weekend went very, very well. Um, there's a lot of course updates that are ongoing, and I do apologize off the top of my head. I do not know what they are. Uh, you know, we've expanded our arson um, uh, capabilities, uh, arson investigation capabilities, and we've added four new, I believe it's four new burn cells, um, and we're really enhancing our um, props, right, and our capabilities uh, to have um, training on site and scenario training, scenario based training on site. Uh, we are waiting for FEMA budget. We just got our, our 24 budget approval. You probably saw that in the news so that we could work on our IT infrastructure. And so the problem is the 24 budget we got, they cut it in half. And so it's going to be very difficult for us to work on the IT infrastructure. And that's part of the issue with students on campus. It's very frustrating uh, when you can't get on uh, Wi-Fi even for your class. So that we are working on. So we've got um, in the FY25 budget, there is additional money for a good bit for the IT infrastructure and also for um, roofs. We got three buildings that we're going to have to close, which means that we're going to lose 170 rooms, dorm rooms, if we don't get these roofs fixed. They're 100 years old. Uh, we've told OMB, we've told FEMA. So we do have it in the FY25 uh, president's budget if we can get Congress to pass it. Otherwise, we're going to have some real reduction of our student capability on campus. And that's us, that's NFA and it's EMI, um, you know, on uh, USFA runs the total campus. So these are some of our challenges. I know that might not be what you wanted to hear. You want to hear about curriculum, but um, <laughs> these are some of the challenges that uh, I will just tell you that we are faced with. No, I think it's good too that we hear some of the challenges that are going on in the, in the back. I think we all just, it's horrible to say this, but we all take for granted that that facility just runs and we're yeah. able to go up there and have a great educational, you know, experience that, that we get from the NFA. So um, to, to hear some of these things, I think it's good for us to hear. And then, you know, hopefully people can take those back to their, their Congress people and senators and things like that and say, hey, listen, you know, this is important for us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this, uh... very important. It is important, and I can tell you, it is. Uh, if we don't get some funding uh, for that mm -hmm. campus maintenance, uh, it's it's not going to be pretty. And uh, you guys should know that. So I will I will say, whomever you can talk to, we've got some real issues, and uh, we stand to lose office space, uh, classroom space, and dorm space. And I am not a uh, lobbyist, but I, I can attest that you know in Missouri. Uh, and it probably holds true across the country is, is that, you know, Dr. Moore and Merrill can go and talk till she's blue in the face, but when it's a local fire chief talking to a local state senator or a local congressperson, um, and you're telling them it affects their constituents, and you can go and tell their constituents something, it holds a lot of, uh, a lot of impact um, in, in their decisions they make. And please correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to speak out of turn, Dr. Moore, but yeah, it, yes. it really is. It really that that so, works. Yeah, uh, when they know it's affecting their people. Uh, there was a question that was raised about AI and near us and how that would impact and if there was any 
uh, AI built into that and, and how that would work. So. Yeah, of course. That's a great question. Um, so yes, there is going to be AI built into Nearest. The AI is what we call narrow machine learning AI. Okay, So you can Google that and read a little bit about it. What it does is it's really the capability to look for patterns that we might miss as humans. And so the AI will watch for patterns. And I'll give you an example of how this might work, right? So um, let's put ourselves back um, before we knew about COVID, right? If we had had this capability to monitor our national data with an algorithm that we create, uh, that we code, to watch for patterns in your incident data across the nation, we might have realized that we were seeing fire departments responding multiple times to the same types of symptoms. Uh, they might have been clustered uh, at locations like you know, uh, nursing homes or facilities, uh, high-rise buildings where you've got multiple families living, but we might have seen some of these patterns and realized we might not have known it was COVID. I'm not saying that, but we would have known something's going on because our fire departments are responding to the same types of calls and the clusters are are in a strange, uh, a strange, you know, is showing up in a strange pattern. So these are the kinds of things that I think we using uh, the types of calls you're responding to that can tell us, give us insights as a nation. I think we'll also be able to see from a preparedness standpoint where we've got um, mismatches in resource capability to risk. And, you know, if you've heard me talk before, you guys know that I harp a lot about making sure that we match our resources that are deployed, firefighters, equipment, training, prep, all of that to the risk event to which you're responding. Because if we don't match well, we have firefighters killed, we have injured us and, and dead civilians, and we have property loss that is greatly uh, increased. So matching resources to risk is a big deal. So I think we'll be able to watch and look for patterns of capabilities versus risk and be able to give you much better insights about where you're prepared in your communities to face potential risk that you're gonna have to respond to from an all hazard standpoint um, than we have today. So these are things that AI will help us to model and see and understand in that narrow machine learning space. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, I think it'd be great. I think uh, I think those patterns and, and identifying those and then giving us that data that then we can do and actually make some some true decisions and not just take some wild guesses and think this is what we should do, but actually have some data points to actually build off of. It's going to be fantastic for us. When do you envision full implementation of nearness to occur for all agencies? Oh, that's good. So I actually had that question come from uh, Congress yesterday. I was in a hearing with the Science and Technology uh, Committee, which we fall under uh, in the House, and they asked the same question. So we have calculated the what is required how many departments do we have to have onboarded and what departments it's not just a number it is in the nation there are what we would refer to as self-representing departments in other words you cannot have a national sample without them so fdny is one of them right houston chicago these are self-representing departments that there is no national sample unless you've included them so we have those, and then we know regionally and department size, scale, scope, we've calculated the sample that constitutes a national sample. So we're gonna work very hard at reaching those particular departments. And then having, we've got also a, a second level. In other words, we can't get that one, where's their match? And so they've been, they've been paired from a sample standpoint. So we're working toward the national sample. As soon as we meet the national sample, we will deem nearest now the national data set. It will already have been become the national data platform, but we would not be able to cite national statistics from it until we reach the sample. Does that make sense? So that's one phase, making it now the national data set. That means we got enough information in there to deem it. We can extrapolate the information nationally. Okay, so that's one way. It's how do you talk about the data contained in the system? The other thing is, I'll tell you right from the beginning, when we start onboarding in November, as soon as you onboard, we will say you can stop doing infers. So as we bring departments up, we'll stand down their infers input. So once you're on board, you stop doing infers. 
once we um, get the, the teeter-totter going here, and so we are onboarding and bringing departments on near us, we plan to decommission, um, which will give you a last, last chance to continue your onboarding, stop in for uh, probably early Q2 of 2025, certainly by the summer. Uh, of next year, we are shutting down near uh, Infers. We're going to decommission it. Uh, we'll archive all the data that's in there and stop. Uh, it's going to be shut down as a system. So about this time next year, you're going to hear us really pushing you to onboard, get your department. That's why all of the cultural change now um, prep and get your department on board because Infers will be decommissioned uh, by certainly by, I hope by the first of Q2, but certainly by the end of Q2. That's just wild. It's a, I can't imagine the undertaking to bring a, a large set of fire agencies like that under one reporting system and the change. Um, it, it's quite a, quite a project that, that you've <laughs> But it's I pray a lot. I'm yeah. just gonna say, uh, you know, I yeah. am. Uh, I, I'm hoping that's why it's. I hope it's exciting to you all. I hope there's an energy nationwide mm -hmm. around it. I hope you'll come and, and help us. Right? Please talk about it. Talk about it when you teach. We'll send you the slides. I had two today. Kevin uh, Sommer out of Michigan is doing a presentation on nearest today. Uh, Idaho, I believe State Fire Marshal is going to do a presentation. We'll give you, if you all want to talk about it, we'll give you the content. Please push it out. We want everyone talking about this. Uh, we prepare you. It's not like we just send you a set of slides, but we'll prep you to talk about it. Um, but we, we can't do this alone, so we do need you. No, we're definitely a, a partner. And, and just so everyone's aware on the call, too, so we just developed a new strategic plan last year. and. So, you know, looking at what the national strategy is and trying to be an, an actual partner with that is, you know, if you look at our, our plan, advocacy and collaboration are two of our, our five benchmarks we're looking at. So, you know, we are looking for ways to, to be advocates. And so obviously advocating for nearest, educating people, education is a component that we, that we have within there as well. So it falls right in line with what our, what our goals are as an organization and a society. So um, it just makes complete sense. And so, uh, we've been going about an hour, so I would open up to any last questions and be respectful of uh, Dr. Moore Merrill's time. Hey, Anybody Brian, final you have questions a, somebody, I, yeah, Dave Robertson has his hand raised, so uh, Dave, why don't you oh, un, okay. unmute yourself? Unmute, Dave. And thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you, Dr. Moore Merrill. Yep. Uh, first of all, I can't tell you how um, incredibly valuable it is uh, uh, when someone in your position uh, has these kinds of conversations, um, and obviously the you know, us carrying it, uh, this communication out into fire service land is, is uh, you know, we're, we're some of the linchpins, but it's incredibly valuable for, for you to do that uh, when somebody like yourself and, and Superintendent Gablix speaks to us, which is, uh, I just wanted to mention to the audience before I ask my question, um, that the last happy hour, uh, which I think is now archived, uh, had Superintendent Gablix uh, on it, um, talking about the NFA, Brian, because you were asking about uh, what's some of the new stuff that's happening in, at the NFA, and he addresses a lot of that. Um, yeah. So the question is, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Moore Merrill, if you could revisit, um, I, I'm having problems wrapping my head around this, uh, this urge to, or this directive to uh, change the semantics of, of wildland fire or wildland slash wooey um, and separating the two. Um, I, I'm kind of, I, for me, coming from the tail end of my career, um, although I'm stepping back into it, uh, where I was with CAL FIRE, Core Missions, Wildland, but the two are so tightly married, right? These are sister events always, and that actually most WUI events um, start in the Wildland. So I'm trying to I'm trying to wrap my head around exactly what was what the directive was there, the communique was there. Absolutely. Happy to do that. And thanks. Thank you for uh, um, the kudos to the superintendent. He's a rock star, as you all know. Um, so thanks for that. Yeah, let's let's talk that through. And, and it's defined also in the commission because we really leaned into this. Uh, one of the reasons is that la wild land is a location, as I'm sure you all know, um, an interface where the the two come together. You've got a community that abuts a wildland arena. That's the interface. There are intermixed communities where we've got houses sporadically dabbled around in the wild land. And then you have suburban 
communities. So just past those that are technically the interface, now uh, in those suburban communities as it moves forward. And then we have fires that are exclusively suburban conflagrations that have nothing to do with the wild land, much like the Marshall Fire, which was a grass-fed fire. Uh, you have Lahaina, which was absolutely not wild land. Uh, that is a suburban conflagration uh, in a drought, structure-to-structure uh, -structure fire spread. So it's the realization that the face of things have changed um, due to drought and all of the, the other contributing factors. Um, along with that, if we continue to say wild land and Congress hears wild land fire, um, any legislation that gets written, any funding opportunity that gets done, everything, and I do mean everything, goes to DOI, the Bureau of Lands Management, or the U.S. Forest Service at um, the um, USDA. We get nothing. FEMA gets the cleanup, the post fire, um, and they get the uh, FMAG, uh, our fire mitigation assistance grants opportunity. We have nothing to train, zero, to train structural firefighters to respond to suburban conflagrations when more than one structure is on fire. It is not the same stat tactics and strategies. I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir. Um, we are not talking about interface where we do have training uh, for crossover into wildland and wildland crossover into structure, but that interface training, our structural firefighters need it. When we have Boston Fire Department responding to a, a conflagration of multiple structure to structure spread, they're not trained for that. They pull down into cul-de-sacs and hook the hydrants. I mean, this is, we have to teach it differently. We have no funds for that. Um, these are the kinds of conversations when the Wildland Fire Mitigation Commission, our Management Mitigation Commission was formed, it was called the Wildland Fire Mitigation Commission, right? Because Congress didn't know any better. Wildfire is what we're worried about. The land space varies. Wildland, suburbia, interface. Wildfire is the entity and where it's taking place matters. So this is why we are being very diligent about describing what's burning and what's burning often um, dictates who's responding. Now I say often because California tends to be different. We still have, even in California, and I met on Monday with a group of Cal chiefs um, who are structural municipal fire chiefs who are continuously responding on federal lands with no compensation. They have mutual agreements in place for fire response, but that's supposed to be mutual. When you have the U.S. Forest Service who's not even staffing their stations, it's not mutual. When you have municipal firefighters who are responding on federal lands in a wildland scenario and no one's coming for an hour, two hours, then they're coming with aerial support, it's our people who are boots on the ground. And yet we have nothing to train them. We have nothing uh, to be able to uh, make sure, you know, they're equipped or prepared. There's, there's nothing because People understand wildland and interior and ag keep getting the money. So I, I hope I get a little passionate about this because it continues to happen. And uh, I have testified in Congress about it. Uh, we've gone on record uh, in a lot of places. It's in the commission report on purpose. And so it has got to stop and to the tune of, uh, and we're compiling the data. So I'm looking around my desk here so I can put my hands on it. Oh, it's behind me. We're compiling the data in Southern California of how many times municipal structural firefighters. Now I know they're cross-trained, not the point. The point is they're responding on federal lands and it's not under a mutual agreement. And technically it's a gift to government and that has to stop. So that's why I know that was a really long answer to your question, but I wanted you to have the full scope and scale that this is not just about, you know, what we call it. Although that has got to change or we can't teach the reason why.
Does that help? It definitely does. It, it, it sounds like it just comes down to we're trying to change the semantics so that Congress uh, and the fund givers essentially eventually understand the difference between the two so that we can eventually request those monies where we're currently not getting them. Is that Correct. the short story? That's okay. the short story. If we don't you. say exactly what is happening, we can't frivolously throw around words. Land area is one thing. The fire itself, right, is a whole different entity. So that's why we use wildfire. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Those your words matter, right? It never never words matter <laughs> it, it's so it's, it's so crazy to think like that we know what we're saying in our heads and and chief that's a fantastic point uh you know because we don't think about those things and you know i, I was reading an article the other day about words matter in, in the fire service and it's and, and no truer point than when i'm trying to change the perspective or try to get funding or whatever um you know if it's not worded correctly or we're not using the right verbiage it's not going to work very good very good anyone else with questions final questions for U.S. Fire Administrator. All right. Well, Dr. Ryan, Lightmore, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure speaking with you and, and hearing your message. Uh, we look forward to seeing you. I'm sure I will see you uh, next week at FDIC. I will then, be there. Yeah. You'll hear a lot of what you just heard, probably. So you guys yeah, we're, pretend we're, you we're, haven't heard it. <laughs> no, it'll be good. It'll be good. And if anybody's going up there and we're having conversations, these, these are great topics to have the conversations at night about near us, about, you know, the, the U.S. Fire Administration's fire strategy moving forward. You know, we, these are things that we should be talking about and should be front and center on our topics. And so I encourage everyone to, to discuss these things. Uh, we'll be at ISFSI. We'll be up at CFSI. So uh, we'll be up there again advocating on, on behalf of the USFA and, and their message. And then, of course, in October, we look forward to the summit. And, uh, and being a participant in that as well. So it was very good. But again, thank you guys, everyone, for joining today. Uh, thank you so much for being on with us. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you here next week. So long, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.